Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Seiji Shrane. Um, I teach Japanese history at the City College of New York. Uh, and on behalf of the Modern Japan History Association, uh, really ecstatic to have this book talk by uh, Professor Joseph Seeley of UVA and our distinguished uh, discussant, Professor Andre Schmidt of the University of Toronto. Um, uh, professor Seeley is an assistant professor of history at UVA and a specialist in the history of Korea, the Japanese Empire, and East Asian environmental history. In addition to his book today, Border of Water and Ice, The Yalu River and Japanese Imperialism in Korea and Manchuria by Cornell University Press, uh, which is open access, but also available in paperback. He's published on topics such as animal disease control in colonial Korea, U.S.-Korean diplomatic history, Korean-Tiger human relations, and the history of Japanese colonial zoos in Seoul and Taipei. And today, as discussant, we have Professor Andre Schmidt, who is Professor of History at the University of Toronto. Uh, his first book, Korea Between Empires, 1895 to 1919, by Columbia University Press in 2002, received the John Whitney Hall Award. Uh, and his second book uh, just came, uh, came out quite recently in 2024, North Korea's Mundane Revolution, Socialist Living and the Rise of Kim Il-sung, 1953 to 1965. Uh, he's also the author, author of the much-cited Journal of Asian Studies article in 2000, The Korea Problem in the Historiography of Modern Japan, a review article, which uh, obviously had a huge impact on students like me and Joseph and everyone in the field. Uh, and I think has uh, done a lot to push uh, the field of Japanese empire in a multilingual uh, um, direction. You really cannot write about Korea, Taiwan, China without really working on uh, at least two languages. Not everyone can do what Joseph does with three, uh, but uh, we're, we're all trying. So uh, we'll hand it off to Joseph and very excited for his um, presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Seiji for the kind introduction. Um, just gonna pull up the presentation here. Everyone see this? Good, thumbs up. All right. Um, yes, today is special publication day for me and I can think of no better way to celebrate it than with my friends and colleagues here, at Modern Japan History Association. It's really great. Seiji and Nick and others have done to put this together. Um, and I'm really flattered that Andre, Dr. Schmidt accepted the invitation to join us as discussant. His, Korea Between Empires is one of the first history monographs I read as an undergrad about East Asian history. It was really inspirational. And as Seiji said, you know, I remember starting out at Stanford with a PhD, my Japan Imperial Archives seminar taught by Jun Uchida. One of the first things we read was the colonialism and the Korea problem, historiography in modern Japan. Um, it has been inspirational, I'm sure, for many of us working on modern Japanese history and especially history of Japanese colonialism. Um, so without further ado, yes, the book, it's out, Border of Water and Ice, the Yalu River in Japan's Empire in Korea, Manchuria. And this border of water and ice, the Yalu River that I look at, is together with the neighboring Tumen River, forms the boundary between the Korean Peninsula and Northeast China, historically referred to commonly as Manchuria. And this map here is one I use at um, the the beginning of the book, and I tilt the perspective a little bit from our typical north is up perspective, just to highlight the fact that the Yalu really sits at the center of Northeast Asia, and I would argue at the center of Northeast Asian history. And for those of us um, who know anything about the border today, this border between what's now North Korea, Democratic People's Republic Korea, and People's Republic of China, um, you might have encountered in the news about defectors trying to escape via this border from North Korea into China also a lively site for smuggling and illicit economies, but it's heavily guarded and surveilled as well. And this is all important, um, but this is the Modern Japan History Association after all. And I am going to be talking about the early 20th century when Japan was a major player in this region. And when the Yalu, neighboring Tumen, formed part of the longest formal imperial border, land border of the Japanese empire. So following Japan's annexation of Korea in 1910, the Yalu became this really strategic site for not only cementing control over the Korean peninsula, but also projecting imperial power further into Manchuria, which was another key site, of course, of Japanese imperial expansion. And, you know, my study doesn't end with 1931 with the occupation of Manchuria, which surprises some people, honestly. They're like, wait, after 1931, isn't it basically not a border anymore? Japan controls both sides. 
But as my study shows, even in its transformation into intra-imperial boundary, you know, Japanese continue to try to police and control this as a border in a very important way between the puppet or client state of Manchukuo and the formal Japanese colony of Korea. And that sometimes there was these intra-imperial tensions that manifested over um, the policing of the border. And so my work joins a number of recent works, um, including by people, some of them might be in this room, working on the history of Japan's empire. There's been a really boom in English language studies of Japanese imperialism. What my work tries to do is perhaps a little different from most. Um, there's a few of us now that are writing these histories that try to put natural forces, you know, to make non-human actors an important part of the story of imperial border politics. And in my case, the Yala River and its seasonal changes. But before I go any further, I want to talk a little bit about what brought me to this project. Because while it's been my dream to be a professor for a while, it wasn't necessarily always my dream to write a history of the Yala River border from 1905 to 1945, focusing on Japanese imperialism um, and the environment. There's obviously a process there, as many of us come to our project for different reasons, right? Um, so I have two images here to help kind of illustrate the points I want to make about how this project came to be. So the first on the left you see here um, is a map of all the different archives and libraries I visited across East Asia while doing the research for this project. You can see Japan, South Korea, mainland China, Taiwan did not make it to North Korea. Might have been cool. The last time someone from UVA went to North Korea it didn't end well. Um, you can read the news about that. Um, and my own interest in doing a kind of transnational study of East Asia, but cited at this particular border region during a period of Japanese imperial expansion, emerged, you know, growing up, I didn't have a lot of exposure to Asia, grew up in small towns in Utah and Idaho. I wanted to study history. I loved history. But I actually wanted to study medieval European history. And then um, life took me in a different direction, I think for the better. I was called as a Mormon missionary to South Korea. I lived in Busan, so opposite side of the peninsula from the Yalu, but really developed an interest in Korea, especially Korea's modern history, which led me to start studying Japanese, spent time at IUC in Yokohama, became a bit of a Japanophile, although I was the weird kid in Japanese language classes who wanted to talk about colonialism, and a lot of people wanted to just like talk about anime and stuff, especially as an undergrad. Um, and then I also studied Chinese. My wife, Chinese-American, was doing an internship program in Nanjing. So I, I lived a year in Nanjing and studied Chinese intensively there. And so I wanted, going into the PhD, I wanted a project that sort of brought all of the CJK, you know, China, Japan, Korea parts of East Asia together, but was still somewhat manageable for a dissertation. And I also had this interest in the environment and hence the, the right image here on this slide. So growing up in Southern Utah, I lived about an hour's drive away from Zion National Park. Um, and I worked there for a couple of summers when I was just starting school. And beautiful, geologically, geographically, climatically, very different from the Yala River that I study. The river that you see in this image, the Virgin River that formed the Zion Canyon does not freeze over in the winter. This is a desert. Um, that said, it did spark an interest in environmental issues. So going into grad school, want to do something with a brilliant environment in CJK. And I was talking to my senpai, David Fenman, who did this fantastic study of colonial forestry in Korea, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He was like, you know, I looked at the Yalu as part of my book. Why don't you look at that more? It could be interesting with your sort of transnational interests. I said, sure. And I talked to Gina Chia, my advisor. She said that was a great idea too. And then 10 years later, here we are. So give me a background of kind of some of the things that motivated me to go on this study. And now I want to talk a little bit more about some central concepts that really undergird the book. And the first is what I call liquid geographies. So many border studies scholars, when looking at how borders are made and unmade and enforced and policed, have pointed out the critical role of mobility, of human actors' mobility in making borders work. You know, um, And I think this is an important finding. But what I'm trying to do in my book is to consider how human actors, as well as non-human forces of the border, things like the water and ice, work together to shape the politics of the border, to make the border happen. And so liquid geographies, the liquid here really refer, refers to flows. Flows of both human actors, like those you see on in this left photograph here. Some of the actors, you know, I talk about my book, you know, smugglers, anti-Japanese guerrillas, 
timber cutters, opium farmers, all sorts of different people, imperial border agents, but flows of human actors as well as flows of things like water, ice, sediment, fish, timber, that also made up the border. And, you know, the geography is the plural here. I mean, the border looks very different depending on time of year, depending if you're on the upstream, or downstream. And so liquid geographies encompasses all these different flows of human and non-human actors. And what I argue in my book is that the Japanese imperial agents tried to channel and to really contain these flows, channel these flows in ways that benefited the projects of imperial expansion. I'm trying to control Korea and project power further into Manchuria, but that is attempt to channel these liquid geographies wasn't always successful. And then, so this is a key concept. Another one is seasonal border making because from the beginning of doing research for this project, you know, when I was just doing my initial newspaper database search for Amnogang Yellow River, I'm typing things in. And I found all these news reports from the period of just the fact, oh, the river froze over. It unfroze, like this was reported in Seoul, you know, that the Yellow River froze over. And reading, reports, memoirs from Japanese border police, they talk so much about the seasonality of the freezing of the river, the unfreezing, the flooding in the summer, how this shapes the way they try to control who and what can cross the border. I may realize this was a central dynamic that wasn't just a footnote. And I mean, some previous studies of border policing, people like Eric Esselstra, Matsuda, Matsuda Tashiko in Japan, there have been people who've talked about sort of policing as part of, you know, the policing of anti-Japanese rebels and things like that. But often these kind of geographic dynamics aren't really talked about in detail. Whereas when I read the sources, they're everywhere. And so my study tries to really grapple with how what I call seasonal border making happens. And I think a lot of history, sometimes we have this temptation as historians, our histories become as climate controlled as the spaces we write them in. Um, but this wasn't true for the historical actors who lived and worked, fought, bled in these spaces, right? So this is an important dynamic I talk about in my book of seasonal order making. Um, so these are sort of the broad concepts at play, but I want to spend the rest of the presentation just going over some specific case studies from the book, drawing primarily from the third chapter, chapter three, in which I talk about the policing of the border against um, so-called bandits or mostly anti-Japanese dissidents, rebels. And to really make these points, especially about liquid geography and seasonal border making, to really drive them home, I've organized this presentation by season. I'll be moving from spring, then the summer, then autumn, and then winter. And I really hope this is an intuitive format for all of us, but we'll be going from spring, summer, autumn, winter. And then we'll be moving across the seasons, but I'll also be moving chronologically as well the more conventional year by year thing that we're most familiar with as historians. So I uh, will be talking about how certain key moments do influence the politics of the border, like 1919 with the March 1st and May 4th movements, and then September 1931 with the Manchurian incident, the Japanese occupation of Manchuria. Well, let me start first with the spring. So springtime along the Yalaga border, um, usually known as the thawing period. So Kaihyoki in the Japanese, Hebingi in the Korean. And there's a Japanese border police officer, Matsuko Shuji, who wrote about this thawing period. And according to him, he said, for Japanese colonial border police, the happiest time of the year was not Oshogatsu, the Japanese New Year. It wasn't Obon, these traditional holidays of greatest festivity in the calendar. Rather, it was this festival-like period of about three or four days at the beginning of spring, when the ice on the Yalu, which had been there all winter, started to break apart. And because during these three or four days, nothing could cross the river. And thus, for this border policeman, you know, that blocked the movement of these so-called bandits across the river and everyone would, could be happy and celebrate. Now, what, who were these so-called bandits or hizoku, to use the Japanese term? They included traditional brigand groups in Manchuria, but also included, well, anti-Japanese revolutionaries, activists. Um, and what really helped launch a very vigorous armed resistance movement along the Yalu during the colonial period were events like the March 1st movement and May 4th movement. It both happened around the spring of 1919. Um, so the March 1st movement sort of is familiar to many of us, right? The largest 
um, mostly nonviolent resistance movement to Japanese rule that happened during the period of occupation of Korea. And it's interesting reading some of the core documents of this movement, the kind of documents you assign in your classes. You get the seasonal metaphors that play. Like here's from the March 1st Declaration of Independence saying a new spring has arrived, prompting myriad forms of life to come to life again. The past was the time of freezing ice and snow, stifling the breath of life. The present is the time of mild breezes and warm sunshine, reinvigorating the spirit. And certainly at the end of February come in Korea, you're really hoping for the spring to come soon. But this is also serving metaphorically, of course, as an invitation for a new, more independent life for Korea, right? And these protests took place. Of course, as we know, they were brutally suppressed. Um, and while the protests themselves, initially nonviolent, their suppression, and this sort of outburst of nationalist sentiment did help give rise to a large armed resistance movement, especially as many Korean activists moved into Manchuria, where it was a little more safe from Japanese rule. There, they launched a lot of cross-border raids against the Japanese along the Yalu and Tumen rivers. And of course, also in 1919, you have the May 4th movement in China, which was anti-colonial, anti-Japanese in nature. And the existence of this movement caused many Chinese officials around this point to be sympathetic to Korean rebels that were hiding out in Manchuria and launching raids across the Yalu border. And then every spring, every spring brings with it the anniversary of these events and further volatility to the region from the perspective of the Japanese border police. And so the spring, you get the anniversary of these events. You also get the ice, of course, thawing out. This is the thawing period after all, the Kaioki, that festival-like period only lasts about three or four days, and eventually the river is open to river traffic. And the Yalu geographically, and it's about middle and upper courses, is pretty shallow. But nonetheless, there was still a pretty lively boat traffic along the river. Um, and then one distinctive type of river transportation I talk about in the book is pictured here in this postcard on the left of these propeller boats. So they have these like flat bottoms, and then they have this giant airplane-like propeller that's used to kind of help them go on the river. And these were used to transport like passengers, mail. They were subsidized by the colonial government of Korea. They went kind of the whole course of the river. And so I kind of like to think of them, if any of you watch like the Wild West movies, like the stagecoaches, these were like the stagecoaches of this colonial frontier, the role they played. But much like stagecoaches in the Westerns could come under attack, um, these propeller boats also served at times as to be in targets of attack for people like anti-Japanese dissidents. And that's illustrated in the case of in 1924, May 1924, so the spring of 1924, there is this incident where Saito Mokoto, um, he's the governor general of Korea. He is traveling on one of these propeller boats with some border police as part of a border inspection tour. So he's on the river, they're inspecting the different police outposts along the border when his party is fired upon by a group of anti-Japanese activists on the Manchurian side of the river. And he escapes uninjured. Of course, as those of us who study Japanese history know, there's multiple attempts on Saito's life. Um, this is just one of them, but illustrates from the border place perspective what was so dangerous about this river traffic opening up. They try to pursue the, the attackers on the Manchurian side of the border, can't find them. They blame the Manchurian officials, the Chinese officials for the security breach. Interestingly, the local Chinese county head said the whole thing was fake news basically and blamed the Japanese for making this all up. So they had an excuse to just go and invade Chinese sovereignty and go on the Chinese side of the border. And this is an interesting dynamic that's important when we talk about these liquid geographies that the people fluidly moving across the border include Japanese border police who often used the presence of Korean activists, dissidents on the other side of the border as an excuse to make raids and invade Chinese sovereignty, especially in this period around the 1920s. And see this document here, this is from a Chinese consul in Shinwiju, so this border city. It's talking about every spring and summer, you know, the leaves are thick and Korean activists are making incursions into Korea from Manchuria robbing things, and then the Japanese police follow them and they go into Manchuria and in pursuit of them and how that messes things up for Chinese as well and poses this difficult element. All right, so the spring, 
the ice unfreezes, the boat traffic resumes, and then you have the summer. Summer was known as the flourishing season, the hamoki or the bamugi. And it's flourishing because the vegetation is thick and dense on both sides of the river. If you're running a gorilla insurgency, this is a good time of year because there's more places to hide. There's more things to eat. Um, and from the Japanese border police perspective, this was certainly a dangerous time. And among the dangers of the summertime Yalu was the fact that you had seasonal flooding. So Northern Korea, much like other parts of Korea, even Japan, you know, you have the Suyu in Japan, the Tangma as it's called in Korean, it's the rainy season. Usually around July, August, this was when Yalu received the most rain at any time of the year. So on an almost annual basis, you had flooding that occurred as the river rose its banks in the late summer. I mean, this is just one image here of a particularly big flood in 1926. Um, but there's all these cases of like in August 27, 1921, talking about my book, there was four border police that were riding a raft in the upper Yalu when the rising waters caused the raft to overturn and they were all drowned. And there were also reports in like Chinese newspapers, for example, of Korean dissidents using the flooding and the disruption as a potential opportunity to make attacks. Of course, the flooding along the Yalu, and I go into more detail in the book about this, wasn't just the sort of natural phenomenon that was completely removed from human action. Fact is, the upper Yalu was heavily forested, but during this period it was becoming more deforested as timber was harvested, and this was contributing to the severity of these floods as well. So all these different things combined to make summer, at least um, during this period, the 1920s, that I have these statistics for, um, among the most sort of deadly violent periods in along the border. And so you see these statistics from 1920, 1927, uh, the number of border incidents recorded by the colonial Korean police and August stands out here, as well as other months of the summer. Winter is also pretty high. We'll talk about winter and its particular uh, dangers later. All right, so autumn. We moved from spring to summer, and now we're talking about autumn. And I'm not gonna say a lot about autumn. And that's because my sources don't say a lot about autumn. Because when they do talk about autumn, they say it's too short. They say, we're here in this hot, humid, Northern Korean summer, and then suddenly it's freezing. Um, where did this you know, autumn go? You know, as one border policeman, Yamada Ainosuke wrote, um, it's usually said that a single leaf falling heralds the coming of autumn. But in the northern borders of Korea, that does not apply. If a single leaf falls, then winter is known to be coming. It's like, brace yourself, winter is coming. <laughs> um, and so when my sources do talk about the fall, it's usually, you know, that it's too short. But what they are trying to do in the case of especially border officials is trying to strengthen fortifications with the anticipation of the winter coming. And so here, you have an image of a typical colonial Korean border police station. You see the architecture is mostly sort of Korean style, but you do have this stone watchtower that's been built. And you also have these barbed wire fences. And these are usually constructed with corvée labor, basically commandeered from local border communities. So the autumn, of course, on the eve of the autumn equinox in 1931, you do have a really major event, right? The Manchurian incident. And I think in this group, I won't belabor the sort of details of the Manchurian incident, which I'm sure are familiar to many of us. But what is important, of course, is that Japan occupies all of Northeast China. But even after this, from the perspective of border officials, especially on the colonial Korean side, you know, they still see this as a border and they see it as their duty to protect the violence that's breaking out in Manchuria, especially as communist guerrillas go head to head with Japanese authorities in Manchukuo that their duty is to protect the imperial heartland by preventing this violence from spilling over into the Korean colony. And much of this violence during the 1930s especially came to be associated seasonally with the winter. Now, winter in the, along the Yalu, in a lot of my sources, you know, they don't even use the term winter. They just use the term the icebound period, um, kapyoki in Japanese or gyoribingi in Korean. And the fact is that this was synonymous with winter because for people living and working in this region, the most salient feature of winter was the fact that the river was frozen over. And it was significant because the river 
you know, now provided this avenue for a lot of different bustling traffic, like you see here on top of its frozen surface. But from the perspective of border police, this could be a problem, precisely because, in their words, during the spring through fall, the river served as a kind of moat. But then suddenly, with the freezing over, you have this anarchic accessibility, this freedom of movement that's allowed on its surface. And during the 1930s, I mean, there's concern about the winter and its accessibility that goes back to the beginning of colonial rule. But during the 1930s, especially the sort of anxiety around the winter became very pronounced. And colonial Korean police sources that I've looked at started calling winter the most dangerous time for border security. And I think what helps contribute is the fact that in the 1930s, you have a succession of major raids that are made by, in this case now, it's not just Koreans, but Korean and Chinese guerrillas across the Yala River, across the frozen river. Um, here on the map on the left, you have, there's three different major incidents in the winter of 1934, 35, 36 on Pozong, Tongung, and Taegil. And the second attack on Tongung was probably the largest scale, you know, border raid during the colonial rule. It was around 200 or so guerrillas crossed the border, frozen border, and made this raid. It was larger in scale than the much more famous now attack by Kim Il-sung on Pochumbo in July 1937, but it's been kind of forgotten because it's not associated with someone who's named Kim Il-sung. Um, but the leader of this 1935 raid across the frozen border was Lee Hong Gwang. He was an ethnically Korean Chinese communist. And an interesting, a lot of the reportage at the time, um, there was this misconception that Lee Hong Gwang was a woman. So you can see that in this source on the right, the female hero Lee Hong Gwang is reported in a Chinese magazine. Um, there were women that were part of his guerrilla group um, but he himself was male. But if we want to talk more about sort of the gendered aspects of colonial border violence and its seasonality, happy to do so in the QA. It's certainly just something I discuss in the book itself. And so you have the succession of wintertime guerrilla raids that contributed to an anxiety among colonial officials about the frozen river and what it portends. And I'm going to use a source here that's maybe a bit unconventional, but I think can be really eliminating. And this is Kim Il-sung's autobiography, With the Century. And here he describes how colonial border police were so anxious about the freezing over the river that he says the enemy dragged out the people to break the ice on the Amnok or the Yalu noisily every night to prevent individuals or groups of soldiers from the People's Revolutionary Army from infiltrating their homeland. How the enemy must have dreaded our attack to have devised such a childish defensive measure. Now, I've looked at the sources what's available, what survives um, from all sides, from the Japanese side certainly, have yet to find any record independent of this autobiography that people were literally being commandeered to break holes in the yellow ice. Might be an embellishment on Kim's part. That said, this anxiety about what the frozen river could do did exist, certainly. Um, here's a photograph. This is from a 1933 border police album called Kokyo no Mamori, so literally protecting the national border. And it shows some border police stopping some crossers on the banks of the frozen Yalu. And when I saw this image in the photo album, when I found it, I was in the Waseda University Library and I got really excited, probably unreasonably so, because I'm a nerd, but also because there's a sign. I mean, this signage is like, sign, well, a wooden sign doesn't exist in an archive, right? So I wanted to know what was on this sign? What were people seeing? when they were crossing the border. And so I remember asking the staff member at the library, hey, could I borrow a magnifying glass? I had to look up in Japanese dictionary. How do you say magnifying glass in Japanese? I'm like, can I borrow a magnifying glass so I can read this? And so this is what the best I could do. Um, basically, list rules for travels on ice. Border crossing outside of designated areas are strictly forbidden. Travel outside of designated times is strictly forbidden. Travel at night is strictly forbidden. I've always wondered about this sign, how efficacious it was actually at like helping sort of channel the liquid geography, so to speak, to help control the movement across the border. Like it's in Japanese. We know that literacy rates in this Northern Korean borderland, which is pretty rural and remote are not that high. Um, also, if you're traveling at night, I don't see like spotlights or anything on this sign. So it would probably be pitch black anyway, but maybe it's more about the sort of symbolism, right? The fact that it's trying to project an image of control on the part of channel authorities that in many cases my book shows they didn't actually have entirely. Um, but 
more than signs and or you know supposedly breaking the ice in terms of trying to meet what was perceived as the threat of the winter border you just get more boots on the ground that basically this is a graph i made for the book from you know quarterly the colonial priests would file these reports that showed how many people were stationed along key points along the border and by looking at quarter by quarter basis you could see that in the winter months in december and march especially numbers rise and they kind of decline other times of the year and part of this yes is this fear that you know guerrilla groups might come across the frozen river and attack during the winter also why is this happening there's another factor at play here and the fact is, is that winter was a double-edged sword for imperial authorities on the one hand they're afraid of these guerrilla attacks on the frozen river but a lot of these tobatsu or these suppression campaigns against guerrillas in Manchukuo were occurring during the winter. They were timed for the winter because it's really hard to run a guerrilla insurgency in the winter. And you have less places to hide, the snow. And I remember I, I watched this like recording of an oral interview of a Japanese, former Japanese police officer who was involved in some of these campaigns. He describes, well, of course, it was like freakishly cold. But the reason we did it in the winter was because you could track people's footprints in the snow. The winter is this double-edged sword, um, which probably contributes as well to this rise in numbers. But it wasn't just it wasn't just colonial police that were being mobilized for the winter. You also had a wide-scale mobilization of local communities, especially young men who were mobilized as part of what were called the self-defense corps. So in the Korean side, they have them. They're called Dagyongdan, Chiketan. The Manchurian side also has their equivalent groups. Basically, local youth commandeered to patrol the icy river at night to help local border police. And of course, in colonial documents, in, or I should say, in sort of public facing colonial media, they're portrayed as these volunteers that are doing it all for the great cause of empire. Um, but I think other documents I've read show there's a fair amount of sort of coercion in place where police reaches out to village elder who gets the young boys to kind of do this whether they want to or not. I mean, if you just look at this photograph, I think picture is worth a thousand words. The expressions, the surly looks on these young boys' faces, they're not terribly excited about what's going on, so it seems. Um, but I also have this memoir from a former resident of the border, this who used to live in the Korean town of Sakju, and he describes how, quote, one to two village residents were called up every evening to keep guard during the night. If we heard the sound of a barking dog or something similar across the frozen ice, we had to stare with an intensity that pierced the frozen darkness. And so these, in addition to colonial authorities, it's these young men in many cases that are really on the front lines and they often pay a price for that. Um, in the case of 1936, this major raid on Tegil, um, the first person to fall victim in it was a self-defense corps member, Pakilok, who happened to be on the ice that night, called out when he saw the group approaching and then was shot. And so um, something else I want to briefly discuss, most of this discussion has focused on policing of anti javis rebels, but an important part of my book, and I dev devote a whole chapter to discussions of the illicit economies of the Yalu and smuggling as it took place across this border of water and ice. And I'll just briefly say here, and we can talk more in the Q&A if people want to, about smuggling, about the Yalu's economies. But wintertime was kind of peak season for smuggling. Um, one Korean newspaper put it this way. They said, basically, smugglers wait for the Yalu to freeze over as eagerly as the Christians wait for the coming of their Redeemer. Um, so why is this? Of course, it's easier to cross over the river when it's frozen. Um, but colonial authorities are also doing their means to kind of strengthen the surveillance apparatus. This is an image on the left from the Mayo Shimbo, this Korean newspaper. You have a hut, basically. The custom officers have built a hut on top of the frozen ice so that they can keep track of things. Now, smuggling, as I examine more in my book, is really interesting because on the one hand, a lot of the smuggled goods flowed north from Korea into China. And for the longest time, colonial Korean border officials basically um, you know, closed one eye and let a lot of the smuggling happen because it, it served their purposes. You know, it weakened Chinese sovereignty. It enriched Japanese colonial merchants. But the dynamic changes when Manchukuo happens, because suddenly the Manchukuo government wants the custom taxes. They want to charge customs because they need the revenue. But 
colonial Korean officials have been for the longest time kind of letting smuggling happen, it brought them into direct conflict where you have even colonial Korean police complaining about Manchukuo incursions into their territory. But we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but that's on the top level. Much of the actual smuggling that's being done, especially during the depths of the harsh Yalu winter across the frozen river, are being done by ordinary Korean smugglers. Many of them were Korean men and women, including some of the female smugglers that are shown in this illustration from a colonial publication here on the right. So just in conclusion, uh, just want, I hope this provides you sort of taste of what the book has to offer. And just wanna make the point again that in the efforts to try to channel the liquid geographies, these flows of people's goods, water and ice across the river, um, Japanese agents are involved in this effort, but it, oftentimes these liquid geographies spill outside the bounds that the Japanese officials try to set. And I think, and this happens of course, as determined in large part by these seasonal changes in the river. And I think these dynamics are not just true, of course, of the case study I present, they're true on that border today. And they're true in a lot of other places as well. Um, but I'll just go ahead, stop there. Here's the, the book outline. So what I was sharing for today comes primarily from chapter three, a little bit from chapter four, but I talk about lots of other things like timber industry, fishing, um, dam construction, bridge construction. So people have questions about other aspects of that. I'm happy to talk to them about in Q and A. And here's my shameless self promo right here. Um, the book is free to download. Here's a QR code that I'll leave up for just a little bit. And then there's a discount code as well. If you want a hard copy, the paperback is 24 pre-discount, after discount, it's like less than $20. So I um, hope many people read, sign. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Q&A. Of course, looking forward to Andre's comments as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joseph. Uh, so we'll turn the floor over to uh, Andre. Go ahead. Great. Thanks very much for that, Joseph. And let me begin by thanking Seiji for inviting me to this event. I've heard lots about your association. Um, great to be here. I feel a little bit like an interloper. Um, but since today's sort of borders, I'll self envision myself as one of those smugglers in Joseph Seeley's great book. Um, smugglers have always been favorite characters of mine, so I'll put a positive spin on it. Um, Joseph, great, just fun book. Uh, incredible cast of characters, an incredible richness. Uh, the sources that you use, not just linguistically, but the varieties of them from oral histories to, you know, really tough to read uh, bureaucratic documents um, from memoirs to um, diaries. It's really impressive to see how you pull together all these strands um, into your story. Um, I guess what I most appreciated about the book was the way you pushed me to think about an area I've thought a little bit about, read a little bit about, um, written a little bit about um, in new ways. And a lot of that uh, goes back to um, your environmental approach uh, to the region. And so my questions are going to be more about asking you to explain certain features of that argument, how you connect it up to the colonial history you're discussing at the same time. Um, and I'm asking that from the perspective of a bit of an old fart who, when he was going through graduate school, had no, uh, there was no discussion of environmental history back then, right? Um, so I want you to teach me a little bit today. Um, to begin with, let me just also tell everybody who hasn't read the book that one of the features of the book that's really endearing for me is its sort of open-endedness, right? Um, both the beginning and the conclusion are open to the history that both begins and follows uh, Joseph's uh, book. Um, it's something that is very generous and it speaks to the long durée of the types of issues that are at the heart of the book. Right, if we think about that, and I wanted to start by thinking about that long durée a little bit, um, to think about how, you know, over centuries, by the time um, the book starts, there have been a variety of poor but complex local communities and markets in various parts of the Yalu Basin, right? And over the century, they have formed 
as types of cross-frontier societies. Down to the time of the study and after, these communities have sought to make at least part of their living by taking advantage of their location to trade and deal in various goods, whether it be high-valued commodities such as ginseng in the 18th century, which brought Korea and Manchuria into um, the global silver trade, or whether it be um, down to today, where on the North Korean northern border, puppies are exchanged, um, and unfortunately, women are sexually trafficked, right, in new types of market relations. And all of these times, these are the types of liquid geographies, the mobilities um, that Joseph talks about um, in his book. They're constantly finding a place across centuries of time. Throughout this time, these local communities are confronted by various external forces, primarily but not exclusively states, that have sought to intercede whether to interdict, to interfere, or channel these flows of peoples and goods. In all of these areas, two key factors are present, taxes and bureaucracies of enforcement, right? Their, act their communities are in a way enlivened uh, because they are defined as illegal by these external forces, even as it is often by tax regimes in the form of customs, monopolies, and prohibitions, right? This is what also supports the communities. So if we go back to the late Choson period and the Ming Qing uh, period, we can see that the, the Choson court actually developed this massive series of documents called the Tongmun Huigo. Um, within that massive series of documents, the biggest single category is illegal crossings. I think these start in the 17th century and continue right down into the 19th century. Uh, the types of anecdotes that Joseph tells us about murders on the frontier, right, are, are plentiful in uh, those documents as well, as uh, people are basically mugging and murdering each other, whether it be for deer pelts, timber, or or um, ginseng, right? Uh, much of the vocabulary, like I, it stood out for me that things like uh, wood bandits that uh, come up in the colonial period, you can find those in those earlier era documents as well. So when we begin to look at that form of continuity, right, it becomes one way that the long durée, by looking at a specific place, by looking at these types of communities, by looking at the tax regimes, by looking at what you're calling the liquid geographies, it becomes one way of breaking down the pre-modern versus modern divide, right? It also, if we were to continue down today, it puts the struggles of North Korea on its own border in a very different light than is usually captured in in the media. So this, this book helps us think um, well beyond its own covers, if I may say, it, put it that way. Uh, at the end of Joseph's talk, he, he made sort of a, a move away from the particular to the universal um, by speaking of the Yalu River Basin uh, in comparison to others. I think I, I was remember being surprised pleasantly so by the opening of the conclusion when he's speaking about a river and then he hides the fact that the incidents are, are actually taking place closer to my neck of the woods in the St. Lawrence River between the United States and Canada, right? Um, he later goes on to quote a United Nations report to say that there's over 286 river basins worldwide that cross boundaries. Here the suggestion is that the that the Yalu River is like other river basins, that these types of liquid geographies, this, the problems of enforcement, of redirecting, are present in all these other places. So my first question heads in the direction of uh, away from this universal, because if away the sort of environmental, social geography that you speak of for most of the book um, can be framed in that universal, I then want to ask you, why then do you choose the dates, especially for an environmental history, why then do you choose the dates 1905 and 1945 uh, to bookend your study, right? For a, a history that wants to participate in this more than human history, right? These are very human dates. Um, 
if we can talk about this a little bit more in the form of environmental history and at specific time and place, how does this then help us understand the specificity of this moment in history, the colonial period, right? That's obviously what, what you're focusing on, right? Um, I could imagine that you would choose other dates that were perhaps more privileging of the envir environmental um, in a narrative of the Yalu Basin, but here you're privileging um, the colonial dates, which makes me wonder, uh, not, 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 I'm not so much interested in why, but what it is you're saying this environmental history has to tell us anew about the colonial. What do we learn about the colonial in a new light from understanding um, the environmental history that you tell us? I have, I have some of my own thoughts on that. But I'd love to hear you talk about that. And maybe the answer is simply it's not. Maybe it is just a history of the environment. Maybe it is just a history of, of a human movement. Maybe it is just a history of capitalist markets, right? Um, but then the question goes back to why highlight the colonial, right? Um, so that's sort of an overarching question that I'll come back to um, in a couple of ways over the next while. Uh, to continue on the environmental front, um, you know, one of the things that's also really beautiful is all the non-human actors that evolve in this. It's not only commodities like salt and timber and opium, it's things like boats, it's various forms of protection against the winter cold, right? And indeed, the Yalu River Basin itself is a veritable character um, in this story. And it's, it's really wonderful to see um, such... Uh, sort of the, the, the topography, environment, ecology of a specific location being highlighted um, so, so spectacularly. I see some of the, the sort of productive directions of the way you're working in is the seasonal change, which you influenced, you, you spoke about so much uh, during your oral presentation, right? The people walking through ice, jumping off boats in the summer. I love that sign. <laughs> that you showed written in Japanese. I can just imagine, you know, a Korean smuggler walking halfway through the river at night, seeing a sign in Japanese. <laughs> what do you do? You don't, the last thing you do is turn back, right? Um, um, so there, there's the seasonal approach, which you highlight so much in the text, which I want to come back and ask you about a little bit later on. Uh, there's also sort of a longer term changes in the environment. You didn't speak about the formation of sandy islands in the river delta, over which there's all sorts of disputes. Uh, you spoke less today about the cutting of forests. Right. But I think especially in your last chapter, you, you, you do a really wonderful job of showing the sort of environmental cycle of how that cutting of the timber affects the water watershed, which in turn leads to greater floods with an assortment of impacts, which arguably in the last chapter reaches the point of one of the rationales for the for the building of the Supong Dam, which in turn creates other types of environmental challenges. Um, and I'll just mention the cost to the fish populations at the time. So there's a story of longer term environmental changes. Um, there's one that you highlight less, but strikes me as being also very important. It's what you call the social ecology, a term I really like, uh, which I see as sort of the spurred on demographic changes that are enabled and mobilized by empire, right? There's just a tremendous growth in the size of the population in this period, that increasing density together with obviously related uptick in economic activity in the area um, creates the demands and the possibilities for more smuggling right might make it more difficult to suppress i don't know what the effect of that is on uh, the ability for them to locate um, independence fighters um, but all of these are woven through the text, these different types of approaches to the environment. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about what you call seasonal border making that you highlighted uh, in your oral remarks a little bit more. Uh, you quote a historian of winter um, in colonial New England about the uneven attention of all 12 months of the year. And I can appreciate you showing a lot of attention to um, those 12 months, those four seasons, if I can change it to that. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit more about what we can learn and what we can conclude. What, where do we extrapolate from these four seasons? Because I, you can see how it's a factor in the individual actions of people when they're deciding to do what they do. But in the overarching story you're telling of the colonial period, right? Um, 
where do we rise from that? Or it is, do you want to rise from it? Or is that sort of end stop that seasons are important? We need to take them into account. Or do we go seasons are important and they're important for, in my study, you know, these certain reasons. It wasn't always um, clear to me whether you were looking to make uh, a, a, a broader argument. Um, let me move on to just say that uh, another feature of the book, which is really impressive, is the complexity of the colonial state that you portray. It's pretty clear that you studied under Junuchida on this point. Um, there's, there's, you know, the Japanese to Chinese negotiations. There is the colonial governor general talking to local officials. There's the colonial governor general talking after 1931, the Manchukuo authorities. There's there's the Japanese communities of various types in the locality, right? It's a really complex um, story. Um, what amazed me, and maybe this goes back to the sign, like who the hell put that sign and what was your motivation for putting that sign? And it sort of links with this question I wasn't thinking or planning of it, but, you know, because one of the things that strikes me is that the presence of the state and the things that they are doing in this border, the amount of investments they're putting in just seems so out of proportion to the task at hand, right? Um at one point, you quote an official suggesting that there are 1,000 smugglers, and then you suggest, well, maybe that's too small and it's 2,000. Like that's, whether it's 2,000, that's just really small for, for, what, they're, for what they're doing. Or consider the way um, they're reinforcing for um, the anti-Japanese independence fighters, right? Where you say that by 1940, there's 75,000 military troops after number of, of fighters that are smaller than those smugglers, right? Um, so what gives, uh, you know, what, what's the motivation in all this? Because we keep getting all of this action. And given that your records are largely coming from, from the bureaucratic um, side or the administrative side, uh, what's the motivation in this specific location to invest so darn much. And you, you even mentioned during your speak that some people are surprised that there remained a border after 1931, 1932. It seems, you know, that that's, you know, again, that needs some expl explanation. It's not just that it existed, it's, it's the whys of the bureaucracies at that time. It's always difficult to explain bureaucracies, um, but, you know, that's sort of what I'm asking you to do. Um, another feature of this book that's, fascinating is the depiction of local societies um, along the river. It's rich depictions, always in fragmented, of course, because you don't have documents that focus on those societies other than, you know, police documents or uh, bureaucratic documents, right? So it's a rather fragmented historical record written by people that are not the favorites of the border crossers, right? They're smugglers, they're fighters, they're pain in the butts, basically, right? They're criminalizing them. Um, and we certainly get a sense of resistance to the authorities, some of the distinctions between the upper and lower Yellow Ra River, uh, and the very real sense that there's much more going on in these places than the records of the authorities can tell us. Um, and I, I, I did want to ask you just generally to talk a little bit about how those records skew the picture of the local society. Um, uh, again, it maybe links up to that earlier question. Um, but in particular, I wanted to ask you about the racialization of Koreans in these records. There's some great accounts of individuals like Kim Moon Hwan, the businessman from, I think, was he from Uiju, right? Um, Shin or, Uiju. Yeah, okay, Shin Uiju, um, right, who uses his own respectability um, and his legitimate business is to hide the fact that he's involved in all sorts of other illicit activities. You know, that's a pretty familiar story to most of us at this day and time. Um, and it struck me that one of the things that's missing in these accounts, and I'm wondering whether it's because they're colonial accounts, because they're administrative accounts or records rather, um, is Japanese involvement. 
um, in all of these illicit activities, right? Because as you say several times, they racialize smugglers. Smugglers are Koreans. Yet people like Kim Moon Hwan did not operate without cooperation um, from Japanese. And just as you can imagine, you know, if the standard argument now is Korean collaborators in the colonial period had to work together with Japanese, you know, you can pr be pretty sure that smugglers um, on the frontier were working um, together with Japanese. And, uh, you know, I think as much as we often look for transracial solidarities among sort of good lefty groups, right, it might be useful uh, to find some transracial solidarities among smugglers and the like. It seems to be the way the world works in most places. And it's something um, that that engagement um, between Japanese and Koreans um, in these places where they're right cheek by jowl. Um, and there's money to be made by cooperating um, would be something that I would expect it to have been at, in the in the narrative. Tell me why it's not in the narrative or if it's one, something that was just a problem about uh, the types of sources um, you were using. Um, and, and I guess one of the other examples where it comes up in your book where it struck me as a bit funny um, was when you get these periodic crackdowns on smuggling you know, some agreement between two higher authorities has been made. They agree to crack down on smuggling. And then the Japanese border authorities end up backing away. Why? Because it's the Japanese business interests that are protesting. Okay, so they're, they're right there. There's some type of tie-in or interest with smuggling. Um, you know, Korean businessmen like Kim Moon Hwan probably couldn't um, protest. Smugglers couldn't protest, but these guys certainly could, and it seems that it's in their interest in some ways. So I'd like to hear a little bit about those types of networks. The last question I want to get uh, is a little bit um, bolder, and I want to ask you, uh, again, has a little bit to do with finishing in 1945, but it's more like, what 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 is the ultimate uh, sort of narrative story that you want to tell in the book insofar as my worry is one way I read it is probably not the way you want me to read it right and the way um, I might read it um, is that ultimately like when we get to the final chapter being the Supung Dam and it's basically the final construction in 1944 I think right um that we see that we're ultimately ending with a story of conquest, right? Um, whether it be conquest of nature, whether it be the success of colonialism, <laughs> there were few projects that were as highly touted um, as that project, right? Um, I could imagine you could have ended it with the destruction, if you wanted more symbolically, by American bombers. You could, you right. There's other ways with even with that dam that you could have gone on with the reconstruction in North Korea. Um, so tell me why I, I guess I want you to tell me why I shouldn't read um, this story as ultimately a story of conquest or success in a way that um, maybe then in turn has the effect of downplaying some of the environmental history things which you want to foreground. So that's sort of a, a bit of a big question, um, but I, I'll I'll finish there again. I all these questions are coming out of the fact that I was really stimulated by the read. Uh, there's, you know, it's not an incredibly long book, but it's so rich, right? There is so much in it um, that I really enjoyed it. I thank you for writing it and thank you for sharing it with it today. Okay, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, so uh, we'll give Joseph a few minutes to respond, not to all of Andre's questions, which uh, I'm sure there's a lot to ponder, but uh, maybe uh, uh, a few key ones, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So go ahead, Joseph. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, this is such rich comments. Wow. I'm first off, just so flattered. Uh, read so deeply and all the kind things you had to say. Um, I think the story ends, yes, there's the construction of the Supung Dam, but that's 44. 45, as the rest of the fifth chapter discusses, I mean, they're trying to build other dams along the river. They're trying to replicate that success, and it all comes crashing down. There's a dam started at Weiju. There's a dam started um, another place, and basically they're left incomplete because the empire is overextended. This hubris. I wanted to, like, I maybe 
I sat with the triumphalism a little bit because I wanted to highlight then sort of how the hubris leads to this imperial collapse and overextension. Um, but I think this gets to this question, you know, the focus on the supreme dam, this gets to this question of the sort of coloniality of the story that you were asking early on. Like why, as my introduction discusses, I give a sort of longer history of dynastic attempts to control the border pre the Japanese arrival. Then the conclusion hints to what comes afterwards, of course. So why focus on this period in particular? And I think um, those of us in environmental history recognize that, yes, there are these sort of longer patterns that can be found of sort of human um, environmental interaction. But as one historian famously put it in his book, Something New Under the Sun, about the environmental history of the 20th century, we have what's called the Great Acceleration, just like a massive intensification of extraction, we might term it, of you know, industrial development that changes these dynamics in some really fundamental ways. And we're dealing with the consequences of now, now, right, in this era of climate change. And I think the story of the Yalu in the early 20th century really see the beginnings of this, that during the sort of, say, pre-modern period, you know, these dynasties had very different logics in terms of, you know, they wanted the border as this kind of buffer zone between, say, the Chosen and the Chink. The Japanese, they're building bridges. They want things to be going across the border, even though they're trying to control what and who can cross, right? And they're also intervening by building bridges. And of course, the dam itself, which I didn't mention this in the presentation, but causes the lower Yalu to no longer freeze over in the winter. So one of these really salient things about life in the border, like who would have, you took it for granted. It's wintertime. It's friggishly cold. Of course, the river is going to freeze over, but the dam leads to this change. And of course, we're anxious ourselves about disappearing ice, right, in this current climate change moment we live in. So I think there's something really different about the 20th century and the colonial period about the harbinger of these like really important changes, even though there are these kind of longer durée sort of patterns as well that we can see. And I also want to just make an inter intervention in the field of Javanese colonial history, which I think is very vibrant, and wanted to think more about, you know, the environmental story is important, of course, um, I also think about, like, say, the connections between Manchuria and Korea, like a lot of histories of Japanese empire have tended to focus on just like Korea or Taiwan. But lately, some of us, I mean, Seiji is one of these people are like trying to kind of think across these different imperial borders and how regions are linked. Um, and I was trying to do this as well. And so as far as seasonal border making really quick, I think seasons are important because of the way they sort of shape everyday life. Um, but I think in terms of what's the bigger story to come away from this, I mean, it depends on the story you want to tell. If you're, the way we sort of tell history traditionally has been conditioned to think that, you know, what happens in terms of high politics is like the most important thing, but in an era of disappearing ice and climate change anxiety, maybe knowing that about stories about disappearing yellow ice might have a sort of weight and importance that it didn't have before, right? I mean, history is a constant dialogue. It's changing what we value about different stories and history changes as well. But I think it's also just valuable to think about, you know, everyday life, just like the practices of these people that lived in these regions. Um, so that, and then finally on smuggling, you know, I mean, I remember getting this question really on when I started, early on when I started this research, like, what about corruption? Like we know that like the modern North Korean border, that North Korean border officials are just like hand in hand with local smugglers. You know, you just pay enough money and you go. Like were Japanese colonial police so like righteous and like, um, you know, virtuous in terms of their bureaucratic responsibilities? Oh no. The thing is, it's always hard to find the paper trail, right? For this kind of, you know, official complicity with these underground economies. I found like a couple of newspaper articles that talked about border police being prosecuted for involvement in smuggling, but very, very few. Um, and I referenced the ones I do find, I definitely talk about in the book, but they're just very few. But I think what's more telling is exactly what you told about, talked about already, which is the fact that when they try to crack down, it's the chambers of commerce, local settlers that are like, no, you can't do this, you can't do this. They're basically all tied in. And you know, there's another story really quick and then I'll open up for the audience Q&A because I'm really interested what people have to say. Another story I talk about in my book, in the 1920s, back when there's the Chinese maritime customs of pre-Manchuria, the Chinese customs officials are complaining and they tell this story about how some Korean smugglers basically brought some goods over, Chinese customs officials try to crack down on them, 
they go to the Japanese substation, the police station there in the Japanese settlement, Andong, and they're using this the police phone to call their people back on the Korean side and say the goods got over safely. So whether that was sort of a socialized accusation made by the Chinese customs, I'm inclined to believe that that might have actually happened, that they, there was this deep complicity as well.